Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be sharing a book with you today. Sunday, August 2nd, was, I'm afraid it's passed by a couple of days, World Autism Awareness Day. A very important day indeed, I believe, and I think it should be a month instead of just a day, but today's uh, book reading is going to be a salute to World uh, uh, Autism Awareness Day. So um, here we are with a wonderful book that I think you'll enjoy hearing about. In August of 2012, going back a few years here, while living in London, I was invited to attend the final preview performance of a new play at the Royal National Theatre across the River Thames from my enjoyable job at the Savoy Hotel. The long title of the play surely piqued my interest, even though I had not had the time to do my usual homework. Uh, on either the play nor the book upon which the play was developed. The play was titled, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Little did I know as I arrived at the theater that the play would go on from the National Theater across the Thames to the West End where it ran for five years. A Broadway production of the play also opened in 2014 and ran for two years. The play received innumerable awards on both sides of the big pond. Now, back to my experience, a quick cruise through the program and especially the director's notes while sitting in the audience awaiting the curtain added the facts that the novel of the same name was written by Mr. Mark Haddon and the play by Mr. Simon Stevens. We, the audience, learned that the play involved some significant re reworking of the source material. The focus of the production would concern 15-year-old Christopher John Francis Boone a mathematical genius with an unspecified autism spectrum disorder, although his condition is never explicitly stated in the play. The curious incident of the title is the mystery surrounding the death of Wellington, his neighbor, Mrs. Shears Poodle, after Christopher finds the dog speared with a garden fork. Christopher argues to himself that many rules are made to be broken. So he launches a search for an answer. The play is presented as a reading of Christopher's own writing, read aloud in segments by his teacher a play within a play construct. During his investigation, Christopher happens across letters from his mother, Judy, dated after her alleged death. His supposedly widowed father admits that Christopher's mother, Judy, is indeed alive and living in London with their neighbor with whom she had an affair. He had fabricated the story about her passing away from a heart attack two years prior. He also admits that he killed Wellington in a fit of fury after an argument with Mrs. Shears. Distraught and fearing for his life, Christopher heads to London, traveling by himself for the first time in his life and on what is for him the overstimulating, highly stressful public transit system to find, 
be welcomed and live with his mother. However, his ambition leads him back to his father in the town of Swindon, where he wants to sit an A-level mathematics exam for entrance to higher education institutes in the UK. Christopher achieves the best possible result and gradually reconciles with his father. In a short scene after the curtain call, Christopher reappears to brilliantly solve his favorite questions from the mathematics exam. The play was immensely dynamic, uh, energized, interactive, impulsive, highly physical as staged in conjunction with Lin London's famed physical theater company, Frantic Assembly. The ever-changing and often sudden redirecting of Christopher's attention reflected one often key characteristic of the disorder, although differing greatly from one person to another. Above all, the most impressive Indeed, overwhelmingly element about the mesmerizing production was teenager Mickey Rowe, the first openly autistic actor to authentically play Christopher Booth in the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Despite his condition plus being legally blind, Rowe documented this experience in the book called Fearlessly Different, An Autistic Actor's Journey to Broadway's Biggest Stage. The evening's experience was exhausting, but spellbinding. Today's book in the spotlight is not about the murder of a dog in the nighttime, but it is surely about curious incidents in the life of autistic child Ezra and father author Tom Fields Meyer, whom Ezra calls Abba as part of Jewish tradition. The name of the book is Following Ezra, published in September of 2011. The characters are different, the setting is different, the challenges are different. Above all, Ezra is not Christopher. But the experience of reading this short and powerful true story exceeded the experience of watching the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime on that summer evening in 2012. Both greatly altered, first, my knowledge, and second, my wonder at the challenges and the successes of nurturing and guiding a special needs child on the autism spectrum through the whirly gig world the rest of us take for granted. But, before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Tom Fields Myers' award-winning book, Following Ezra, is subtitled, What One Father Learned About Gumby, Otters, Autism, and Love for His Extraordinary Son. The attention and sensitivity to his son's special view of the world and what he learned from becoming a part of it is central to the book and indeed says a great deal about the author. Tom Fields Myers is both an author and a journalist. A native of Portland, Oregon and a graduate of Harvard University, he has been writing stories for popular audiences for nearly three decades, specializing in telling meaningful and worthwhile narratives with humanity, humor, and grace. 
In his 12 years as senior writer for People magazine, he produced scores of human interest stories and profiles of newsmakers. He penned articles on some of the biggest crime stories of the day, from the O.J. Simpson trial to the murder of Matthew Shepard, the gay American student at the University of Wyoming who was beaten, tortured, and left to die on a fence in a monstrous hate crime near Laramie on the night of December, October 6, 1998. The work of Fields Meyer has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. With Barry M. Frizant, he is the co-author of the book, Uniquely Human, A Different Way of Seeing Autism. He now lives in Los Angeles with his wife, Sean, and their three sons, Ami, Noam, and Ezra. He teaches in the UCLA Extension Writers Program. Following Ezra is a heartwarming, intimate, and amusing memoir of a father's experience raising his son on the autism spectrum. When Tom Fields Byer's son, Ezra, was three and showing early signs of autism, a therapist suggested that the father needed to grieve. For what, he asked. The answer, for the child he didn't turn out to be. That moment helped strengthen the author's resolve to do just the opposite. To love the child Ezra was a quirky boy with a fascinating and complex mind, full of tender moments and unexpected humor. Following Ezra is the story of the father and son on a 10 year journey from Ezra's diagnosis to the dawn of his adolescence. It celebrates his growth from a remote toddler to an extraordinary young man connected in his own remarkable ways to the world around him. Best-selling author of the book, To Begin Again and Hope Will Find You, Naomi Levy shares her reflections. Quote, following Ezra, is a revelation. Life rarely goes according to plan, and too often we try to control situations that are beyond our control. Tom Fields Meyer offers a rare gift. He teaches that the things we least plan for can become our greatest treasures. His book is a personal journey and a great lesson about patience, and the blessing that can come when we let our unique children lead us. End of quote. In my humble opinion, reading following Ezra was life lifting for me in more than one significant way. I think that the, the greatest gift I took away from the experience was of a stop and smell the roses nature. The story of Tom and Ezra reminded me of making a difference, small or significant, on one person's life at a time, which must add up to a tremendous sense of life success and satisfaction when the time comes for the proverbial dance with death. Making a conscious choice, choice, and a decision to impact is one we find more and more challenging in the fast spinning world of today. Stop. 
look outside of my own bubble, focus, then ask, whose life could I impact with the simple sharing of heart and soul? Patience, perseverance, opt for channeling, for channeling light rather than wallowing in the gray skies, daily news. As maybe overly altruistic as it sounds, Tom has reminded me of the joy of making a difference and rekindled in me a desire to clean my lenses and refocus some extra energy I can easily spare for someone else. The book following Ezra is a beauty of a journey and forever inspiring. The book is indeed a small book and at only 200 and no 232 pages. The subtitle of uh, the book, by the way, is what one father learned about Gumby, otters, autism and love from his extraordinary son, as I mentioned. I'm going to begin with a quote that the author places uh, early on in the book. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, quite deserving of mention here. And then I'm going to go on to the prologue. So let me see how early in the book did he place that? <laughs> as his dedication to his parents who were always there following me. And here is the quote, a traditional Jewish blessing. Blessed are you, Lord our God, sovereign of the universe, who creates variety among living beings. Variety. <laughs> And then let me begin with the prologue, which I think sets the stage. And then I'm going to skip ahead to a couple of episodes. I may not have the time to read both of them, but uh, I'm going to try. Let me start with the prologue following Ezra. The walk was always the same. But then one day it was different. In the summer of 1999, my wife, Sean, and I spent two months with our three young sons at a retreat center nestled in the arid foothills bordering Simi Valley, California. The campus was a spectacular sprawling property stretching over gentle golden ridges dotted with eucalyptus, pepper trees, and cactus. Sean, a recently ordained rabbi, was teaching Jewish texts and practices to a group of young adults. The job required long hours, not only in the classroom, but also in intense private discussions of spirituality during meals in the dining hall, on long strolls, and over snacks late in the night. At the same time, she was nurturing the souls of a few dozen 20-somethings we were also busy caring for our boys, Ami, who was five, Ezra, three, and Nuan, 18 months. Some months earlier, Ezra had begun displaying troubling behavior. He isolated himself from his preschool classmates to flip mechanically through picture books. At home, he spent inappropriate periods absorbed in solitary odd activities like lining up plastic dinosaurs and jungle animals and precise symmetrical patterns across the back porch. His sensory system was clearly in disarray. That summer, he was so tortured by the cacophonous noises of the dining hall that he would cover his ears and run out of the doors. At nearly every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we had to designate an adult to keep track of Ezra as he paced alone in small circles on the concrete patio or sought out insects among the boulders and agave plants on a nearby hillside. 
Ezra seemed agitated, even in his sleep. And when he rose at daybreak, it fell upon me to prevent him from waking the other boys or creating enough of a disturbance to rouse the staff members and families neighboring our small bungalow. So Ezra and I began taking walks. The air was cool and crisp at that early hour, the best time to roam the grounds, where peacocks wandered freely and geckos scampered across stone walls and asphalt patches. Ezra was drawn to animals of all kinds, so we wandered down a short dirt road to visit a compact stable that housed the center's small herd of horses. Then, continued up a knoll and into a modest pen where Ezra could meander amid a few dozen chickens and, nearby, peek into a small aviary with parrots and a handful of pigeons. For a boy who spent most of the year in a Los Angeles neighborhood with all of the traffic, smog, and noise that came with it, this was heaven. After a few days, Ezra had worked out a circuit that he insisted on following each morning, paying a visit to the livestock and birds, then continuing a stretch to a little barn, past the swimming pool and sports fields, and up the road to where he had discovered a playground area. There, years before, campus had created a cluster of toddler-sized animals molded from plastic. Ezra would sit on each one, always in exactly the same order. The giraffe, the camel, the snail, and finally, the turtle. Then we wandered to the nearby swing set where I pushed him for a few minutes until he was ready to hop off and stroll back to the cabin, just in time to find his mother and brothers beginning to stir. One morning, instead of turning left, to return to the cabin, Ezra turned right. Other way, Ez, I said, but he didn't hear or chose not to listen. Instead of heading back toward the family, he walked with resolve up the paved road, toddling a few steps ahead of me. I followed closely behind him, calling to him to no avail. Then I dropped back a few paces. It was a private road, and I knew that at that early hour, no cars were likely to come by, not even the groundskeeper's rusty red pickup. So I let my young son walk as I faded 10 feet, then 15, then 20 feet behind. I wondered whether he might become upset, realizing that I was not at his side. He didn't. Ezra followed the curving road amid the brush and eucalyptus up a small hill, around a bend, and on for nearly half a mile. A three-year-old boy ambling up a rural road, more and more isolated from everything and everyone he knew, my son seemed completely on his own. Confident, naive, Bold, aloof, utterly alone. I watched, feeling a combination of fear, bewilderment, and wonder. Fear for his safety, bewilderment at his seeming lack of awareness or connection. Wonder at his resolve to follow his own path to take the road he wanted, even if it was unknown. This book is the story of what happened in the 10 years following that summer, a decade that has delineated a personal journey, beginning in darkness, winding through desperation, frustration, fascination, love, and ultimately, a sense of awe for our unique, exceptional son. 
I started the quest trying my best to be a good dad and an enlightened consumer, searching out the right doctors, the right therapy, the most promising medicine, the breakthrough diet. In time, I learned that what I've been looking for was the wrong thing. Like many parents, I saw my son's challenges as something to get past so that my family and I could get on with our lives. I eventually learned that this is life. This is what life is. It wasn't about finding the right expert for my child. It was about learning to be the right parent. 10 years ago, I watched my solitary boy venture down an isolated road. For a decade, I have watched from an increasing distance and he take, as he takes a path all his own. In some senses, that has made his life richer and fuller. Yet Ezra's path is so singular that I've wondered what he is missing by walking alone in his discreet universe. And then there is this question, as his father, what is my role to run ahead of him and lead him in a safe direction, to walk by his side, holding his hand, to try to pull him back to familiar territory? Long ago, I made my choice to follow Ezra and to watch in awe and mystery as my son makes his own unique way in the world. So I'm going to skip ahead to chapter five. Each chapter is mostly one particular episode lengthily told, uh, beginning with the, the therapy and the diets and the medications, etc. We'll skip that. Let's go to an actual experience, father and son. Finding my son at the zoo is the name of it, of the chapter. With his difficulty mastering the complexities of what one should and shouldn't say to people about their bodies, it's no wonder that Ezra is drawn to animals. You can call a giraffe tall with impunity. You can say all you want about how fat the hippo is without hurting anyone's feelings. In fact, Ezra has been attracted to the idea of animals from early on, becoming so enamored with a friend's plastic jungle animals as a toddler that we gave him some of his own, zebras, a lion, and a tiger for his second birthday. Another child might have employed the figures in imaginary play, say, acting out dramatic, violent interactions between the lion and his prey, but not Ezra. As a toddler, before we truly grasped his differences, he would haul around his growing collection of animals and dinosaur figures to the brick back patio of our Los Angeles home, spending long hours lining up the creatures in precise, symmetrical patterns as Sean and I watched, feeling a combination of amazement and bewilderment. Occasionally, Noam and Ami would knock a rhino or stegosaurus out of place or grab one for their own play and elicit a fit of uncontrollable screaming from Ezra, who was tortured at his precise formation being broken. It's all right, Ezzy, Sean would say, crouching down and trying to put the creatures back in place, but it was impossible to placate him. He seemed to be following a rigid system in his own mind, and only he could fix the problems. At age three, he singles out a three inch long wooden alligator from a jigsaw puzzle as his special companion then designates a similarly sized plastic toy alligator as another. For months, he goes everywhere, 
the playground, the bathtub, clutching one alligator in each hand. Soon after, he adds a foot-long plastic crocodile he keeps nearby at all times. Other children had security blankets. He has security reptiles. That causes its own set of problems. Our family is setting out to visit my parents, in Portland, Oregon, when an airport security screener peeks into Ezra's Elmo backpack and begins shaking her head sternly. I can't imagine what the problem is until she points to the larger plastic crocodile inside. He can't carry that on, she says sternly. He has to, Sean replies, smiling. We don't have a choice. The woman shakes her head again. She explains that it is forbidden to carry a replica of anything that would be illegal on a plane. Guns, bombs, crocodiles. Come on, I plead, it's a toy. Never have parents begged with such persistence for a green hunk of plastic to be allowed onto an airplane, but the woman won't relent. Crocodile, Ezra screams, reaching for the toy. Sean tries to comfort him while I rush back to the airline counter, trying to skip the lengthy line of stone-faced business commuters and explain to a clerk why I am in such a hurry to check a pint-sized Sesame Street backpack and return to my family. Ezra's strong attraction to animals becomes something deeper when the wildlife is real. One autumn Sunday, when he is still free, Sean and I pile the boys into the Toyota minivan and drive to Griffith Park, where the Los Angeles Zoo stretches over 80 acres of gently sloping hills. Our afternoon out with our three young children among the flamingos and meerkats feels to me like a lovely but ordinary family outing. But it is igniting something new within Ezra. This shows up soon after when he is taking his evening bath, and I notice him reciting a long list of animals to himself. Tiger, bear, rhinoceros, hippo. Following along, I suddenly realize what he is doing, ticking off the names of the animals in the exact order we saw them at the zoo. The next time we return to Griffith Park, he announces most of the animals even before we have arrived at an exhibit. At the seals, now let's go see the polar bears. At the polar bears, now it's time for the otters. Just as with his animal patterns in the backyard, the combination of rigid order and wild animals stimulates him. So we keep going back. I times I, I wonder if it is the animals he is attracted to or or just the order. After school one afternoon, I visit the zoo with Ezra, who is so eager that he pulls my eye, my arm, to get as quickly as possible from the car to the gate. Then he dashes on his regular circuit through the zoo, barely pausing. I feel baffled by the behavior and upset at how disconnected he seems. On the drive home, I ask Ezra why he didn't stop to look at the animals. Silence. I thought we came here to look at the giraffes and the lions and the gorillas, I say. What were you doing? As we make our way through downtown traffic, he is silent again for a few moments and then says something just audible. I saw them. Yes, but I can't fathom what could explain his rush. Not long after that, we were at a local children's museum that has an interactive Noah's Ark exhibit, including large buckets of the plastic animals Ezra so enjoys. While the other boys circulate through the various displays and activities, 
Ezra spends the entire hour picking through the animals, dividing them by species and size in the toy ox small compartments. It strikes me that this is exactly what has been drawing Ezra to the zoo. He has cataloged all of the species in his mind. He draws comfort from finding them where they're supposed to be. The koalas in the tree, the lemurs in their cage, the elephants wandering their ground. Nearly everywhere else he goes, my son is filled with anxiety. Human beings can be unpredictable and scary with their social rules and their subtle facial expressions. But the giraffes don't ask questions. And the chimps don't care what you say about them. Ezra doesn't merely want to see animals. He wants to live in this mannered world with its patterns and structures and where there are no surprises. On another afternoon, I encourage him to walk slowly and I hang back to see what he will do. We arrive at the sea lions just as a zookeeper brings a pail of fish for lunch. Ezra leans on the metal rail and gazes for half an hour, entranced, watching the keeper toss fish. He's fascinated with how the creatures swim for their food, crawling in and out of the pool. I think of how Ezra can barely sit at the cafeteria table, how he endures karate lessons only while asking his instructor every two minutes when the hour will be up. As I watch him smile with delight, I feel a profound sense of hope. Hope mixed with sadness, hope that he has found something that brings him such pleasure. Sadness that he hasn't shown that kind of focused engagement with other people. Instead of letting his passion for animals become yet another lonely uh, avenue, I decide to make it the foundation of a connection between the two of us. I find myself making the trek to Griffith Park as frequently as I can. Elsewhere, Ezra can be in a tangle of ties and repetitive motions, uttering snippets of video dialogue and hiding out under blankets or mattresses. At the zoo, all that melts away. I let him flash our membership card. We pass through the familiar gates and I watch him sprint to the sea lions, morphing within minutes into a different boy. Calm, open, happy. Oh, there's the ocelot. You see it, he says, a lilt in his voice, eyes wide with innocent delight. Friends tease me, curious about how a grown man could spend so much time watching koalas chew on leaves, but I never tire of watching my son. Never get bored with the way the zoo transforms him. I cherish those 60 or 90 minutes in which I can connect with Ezra and we can fit in with the crowds just like any other father and son. And I feel continually surprised by the revelations that come from Ezra's fascination with animals. Long after Ami and even Noam have outgrown their interest in zoo visits, as most children do, Ezra's attraction just soars. For Ezra's 10th birthday, Sean's brother and his wife sent him a book that might have come straight out of Ezra's dreams. Animal, the definitive visual guide to the world's wildlife, is a seven and a half pound book. 625 page visual encyclopedia of nearly every animal on the planet. Ezra adopts the hefty volume with its cover close up of a mandrel's colorful face as his constant companion. On Saturday mornings, he silently pours over it in synagogue as if it were the Torah itself. 
On the school bus, while other kids chat or stare off, Ezra inhales data about habitats and extinction rates. I come to think of it as my son's way of bringing the zoo along with him. Not long after that, during another visit to Portland, my father takes a morning off from work to bring Ezra and me to the Oregon Zoo. As the three of us make our way, Dad grows amused and enchanted by his grandson's enthusiasm and knowledge. We are in a complex of squat buildings housing the primates when Dad looks into one cage. What kind of monkey is that? He asks. That's not a monkey. It's a siamang, the largest gibbon. Lower risk of extinction, Ezra tells him. Moving on quickly to the next exhibit. Dad surreptitiously pulls out his cell phone and accesses the internet. He's right, he says with a delighted grin. I feel gratified that my father has shared the kind of moment I've experienced so often with Ezra, an instant of grasping and celebrating what makes his grandson unique. Ezra doesn't simply remember the animals. He has a remarkable recall of his interactions with them. At nine years old, he is reading aloud to me from a book that mentions a character's favorite bird. I take the opportunity to ask him his. A woodpecker, he says. I ask him if he has ever seen a woodpecker. No, he says, but I've heard one when we were on a hike on November 28, 2003. It was a Friday. He is, of course, correct. A year and a half earlier, friends joined us for an outing in Malibu the day after Thanksgiving. Ezra asked that morning about the ticking sound he kept hearing echoing through the woods. I wasn't aware that he had tucked away the memory. In fact, he has accumulated an extensive mental diary of such moments whose entries he shares spontaneously at random moments over pizza or in the car. His are not mere fleeting memories. They seem to transport him back to the place and time as if Ezra is reliving the sights and sounds and even the feelings he had inside. Remember at the Santa Barbara Zoo in November of 2005, he says over his oatmeal, breaking into laughter, when that baby threw her daddy's hat into the otters? <laughs> he giggles loudly and recounts again and again the time at a zoo when he happened upon the sun bear exhibit just in time to spot one of the bears urinating. Like any pre-adolescent, he finds the thought of a peeing animal endlessly funny. He smiles when he remembers the time Sean's parents, then living in Ohio, brought him and his brothers to visit a farm where an unruly goose made its presence known with loud and persistent honking. But the memories aren't all good. Once, on a visit to a small zoo in rural Big Bear, California, we arrive at an enclosure of owls just after they have been offered a luncheon of dead white mice. For months and years after, I can see him struggle on occasion to block the memory from his brain. Even hearing mention of the name of the zoo makes him physically agitated. So much so that he covers his ears, closes his eyes and says, stop, 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 stop. Possessing a superhuman memory has its drawbacks. When he wants to shake an unpleasant recollection, it can prove difficult. Yet, with the exception of those rare painful images, I can sense that Ezra is accumulating a storehouse full of joyous memories that he carries with him just as he lugs the heavy animal book around. The familiar paths of the Los Angeles Zoo and the other zoos he visits provide a happy place, not school where he struggles to focus and make sense of the rules, not home where he can work himself into a frenzy with his repetitious habits. 
At the zoo, his soul seems serene. I'm building my own experience as well, forging a deep connection with my son through the simple sharing of experiences. The more we visit the zoo, the closer I feel to him. And the more I marvel at his struggles, his worries, his quirks, and his wondrous mind. Without setting out to do so, I have discovered a place and a way to connect with Ezra. Not everyone shares my delight in his excitement to see the black necked swans one day when he was 10, Ezra jostles his way past an older man and inadvertently plants himself directly in front of the man's son, blocking the child's view. Excuse me, the man says. Ezra, oblivious to such social nuance, just keeps gazing. Do you mind, the man continues. He doesn't. Abba, you see the swan? Ezra says, still not noticing the man and now outing me as his escort. The man glares at me. He could say, excuse me, the man says. I have an answer prepared for such occasions, but I never actually trot it out. I imagine myself stepping over, putting my face right in his, narrowing my eyes and unloading. Mister, I say, it's a miracle that kid can speak at all. That would be followed by a lecture on the neurological underpinnings of autism and a sob story about my son's journey through special education and a series of doctors and therapists and conclude with the final admonition I think you're the one who should say, excuse me. That's what I dream of saying. Instead, I follow Ezra's lead. I ignore the man and watch the animal. Occasionally, I wonder whether it might be better in such situations to educate strangers by patiently explaining what makes my son different. But I honestly err on the side of letting people experience a different kind of person, unfiltered. Yes, I see it, I say, looking at the swan. It's beautiful, isn't it? By then, Ezra has slipped through the crowd and I trail him as he scurries off toward the Chinese alligator, blissfully unaware of the disgruntled gentleman he is leaving behind. Even when he isn't bumping into people, Ezra could stand out. There simply aren't many children his size at the zoo cooing so excitedly and loudly over the animals. He's never really learned sensitivity about controlling the volume of his voice, even in places like movie theaters and restaurants. So he certainly isn't going to learn that among the Sunday throngs crowding the paved paths of the LA Zoo. Ezra has developed a particular affection for otters and lemurs, both species that seem to share his playful and gentle nature. Seeing the otters so excites him that on some visits he stands at their enclosure, literally bouncing on his toes with glee and excitedly reciting one factoid after another for every passerby to hear. Those are otters. Otters are mammals. They're in the same family as weasels, badgers, and skunks. My favorite kind is the North American river otter and also the sea otter. He seems more delighted with each new detail. And other visitors must wonder whether perhaps the little boy works here in some capacity. They're carnivores. They like to eat fish. They're very playful. I've heard this litany over and over, though sometimes he surprises me by adding a new piece of information. Otters live on every continent except Australia and Antarctica. One afternoon when he is 11, he's watching the Sifaka lunars pacing and hopping in his orange fleece jacket as he mimics the movements of the animals bouncing inside the cage. 
I love these guys, he squeals. They're so cute. Other visitors come and, so, and go. Moms pushing strollers, a den of Cub Scouts. Occasionally, I catch a couple of them exchanging looks as if to say, what's wrong with that kid? Others, once self-conscious and worried, I have learned from Ezra to ignore these glances. Like Ezra, I lead my troubles and concerns at the zoo gate, letting go of worries about money or work or losing myself in the animals and our shared moments. As much as I shared, sh cherish that lead, I do sometimes wonder whether Ezra might ever find another child with whom to share the experience, a friend to make his existence that much less solitary. One Sunday when Ezra is 10, Sean has joined us at the zoo when a woman about my age approaches. I think my son knows your son from school, she says. Ezra does recognize the boy an awkward 10-year-old who, it turns out, shares his passion for animals at the zoo. The boy is carrying a digital camera and shows us how he likes to catalog the animals, stopping at each exhibit to photograph the informational sign, then the animals inside. His mother explains to us how he prints the photos and assembles them into albums he likes to flip through at home. Sean suggests we walk together. And I feel excited at the idea that Ezra can reach out to a schoolmate and bond over their mutual enthusiasm for wildlife. I imagine play dates at the zoo, hours to be spent musing over the boys' photo albums and Ezra's big book. But the two boys just trudge on, taking a note of the dromedaries and gray wolves, but oblivious to each other. I'm disappointed, but then I look at Ezra, who is unfazed, easy, eager to get to the zebras. Occasionally, the zoo affords us sublime moments I couldn't have experienced anywhere else or with anyone else. One chilly, misty afternoon when Ezra is eight, he notices that a new exhibit has been under construction and it has finally opened. As we get close, Ezra leads me to a side of the enclosure where the floor of the cage is about his eye level. We are the only visitors nearby, and Ezra quickly spots the animal inside, a young snow leopard, gorgeous, white with black spots, pacing back and forth inside the cage. Ed Ezra squeezes his cheek up to the metal enclosure, tracing the leopard's steps with his eyes. Listen, I tell him. We are so close and the place is so quiet that I can hear the leopard rhythmically inhaling and exhaling. He's breathing, Ezra says. As the leopard paces, Ezra lines up his body with the animals mixing and mimicking his steps, pacing back and forth again and again. The air is cool and I see the vapor from the leopard's breath. What's that? Ezra asks. What's coming out of him? You can see his breath, I tell him. Ezra stops pacing and places his hands on the fence between himself and the creature. He takes a few deep breaths, and then I realize what he's doing. Watching the vapor emerging from the leopard, he is adjusting his own breath to be in sync with cats. I take a few steps back and watch my son, who has gone through life seemingly so alone, who would never think of pacing the playground with another child, breathing in near silence with a leopard. I savor the moment, satisfied that I have brought Ezra to a place where he can be at least for two minutes, content and calm, at peace. And then he darts away on to the next animal and the next and the next until it is time to head to the parking lot. 
He senses the change, and even before we exit the gate, he starts in again on the usual chatter about Disney movies and junk food. As we walk hand in hand out toward the car, I wonder if the joy Ezra feels among his animals will ever permeate the rest of his life and hope my little boy might someday feel as content and comfortable among his own species. And then I'd like to read a section about the therapist. I commented on it earlier. I should have listened to Ruth, the first professional we ever consulted about Ezra. The therapist offered some oblique advice a few short months into our sessions. Her morsel of wisdom seemed a little con of little consequence back then, but it came to haunt me later. Quote, very often these kinds of children develop obsessions, she said, things they want to talk about exclusively all the time. She told us about one client, a girl from an un or ultra-Orthodox Jewish family who had developed a severe and persistent preoccupation with Madonna, not the mother of Jesus. That would have been trouble enough. The, the Madonna. The child ranted incessantly about Madonna's music and Madonna's boyfriends. She spewed detailed trivia about Madonna's songs, Madonna's videos, Madonna's wardrobe and Grammys. To teachers, playmates, anyone who would listen, and plenty of people who wouldn't, she would expound on Madonna. And this, Ruth said, raising an eyebrow for emphasis, was not a family in which that was okay. I pondered that for a moment, conjuring a scene of a long Sabbath table, candles aglow atop a white lace tablecloth, a Zoftig matriarch at one end, ladling matzo ball soup, a bearded black clad husband as the other, and 10 or 12 children in between all paying rapt attention as little Rivka, pigtails and elbow length sleeves, skirt to mid calf, holds forth about her favorite cuts from Like a Virgin. But when Ruth issued her warning, Ezra, just then three, hadn't settled on fixations beyond his plastic dinosaurs and jungle animals. In light of this new information, I imagine my little boy progressing up the evolutionary chain from stegosauruses to woolly mammoths to alligators in a steady arc leading directly to pop divas. As I considered that, Ruth offered a cautionary thought. Be careful what you expose him to, she said. You don't know where it will lead. I recall that ominous tidbit of advice on Doc and Westwood Boulevard, powerless to budge my shuddering, wailing bundle of tears. I'm not sitting cross-legged on the cool sidewalk, wondering how I might ever distract Ezra from what has become an all-consuming quest. You don't know where it will lead, Ruth said. Well, now I know. In fact, I have recalled her words frequently in the months and years since, each time experiencing a discomforting combination of anticipation and fear. Be careful what you expose him to. What will it be? What will Ezra fixate on upon? In retrospect, these words of counsel have been among the very least helpful bits of wisdom we have gathered in our journey with Ezra. It drives me to books and articles and websites in search of information about children like Ezra, children with autism and Asperger's syndrome, or children who are simply a bit odd. I keep coming across descriptions of little boys who are unable to function among peers and who develop unusual preoccupation with sets of trivia, commuter train schedules, say, or insect species. I read repeatedly about a boy in England with exhaustive command of the minutiae of refrigerator fans, 
and motors. I'm confident Ezra will not find his way to train schedules. For kids in West Los Angeles, public transportation is about as remote and abstract as molecular theory. Refrigerator motors, he's certainly obsessed with the contents of our refrigerator, but I don't think he's even conscious of the mechanical gizmos keeping his snack food chilled. Be careful what you expose him to. How I sometimes wonder, will he do that? Could those boys' mothers and fathers have avoided exposing their tykes to trains or insects or refrigerators? Could dangerous life-sucking obsessions be lurking around every corner? Sometimes I watch Ezra take in the world and wonder what he might seize upon next. Should we have kept him from watching Sesame Street? As a toddler, Ezra was mesmerized, just like many millions of other children, idly picking at his Cheerios as he, as he took in Bert and Ernie's latest tip. And then at a moment that escaped our notice, he crossed over into another zone. He was no longer just another toddler hooked on PPS. He was positively addicted to the Muppets. He spent long hours paging through picture books viewing and reviewing drawings of Cookie Monster and Grover and Zoe. He wasn't mere enthusiasm. Addiction was closer to what it was, and not just to watching the television show, but to populating his world with these characters, to the exclusion of human beings and real interactions. That is the behavior that shows up in Karen's preschool classroom where Ezra seems lost and drifting, except when he spots pictures of the characters he knows from Sesame Street. This is very, very fascinating, the obsession with order and no surprises. Everything exactly the way I've made it for myself. I do hear a lot of this, and so it's a great, great bit of knowledge I learned from reading this book. It's, uh, it's quite wonderful with many examples of challenges and how uh, Dad particularly solved them. Uh, and it, it, uh, and with each discovery that Dad makes, it's just a richer depth that he learns about his son. Um, even remembering all the birth dates and, and days of the week of all the, of the extended family members. It's, it's, it's quite amazing, the mathematical bit, um, which of course was also uh, in play that I saw. So a lot of it matched everything. It's a lovely book, and it's a great salute on my part too. Autism Awareness Day, which is every year on April 2. So I hope you mark your calendar, like a little candle for the day. Let me uh, take a few moments just to tell you about next week's book, if I may. I uh, hope that might lure you. We're going in a very, very different direction. As a matter of fact, we're going to a book that was originally published in 1880. <laughs> I unfortunately am going to a translation of that book. Uh, from 2020. So it is a new and uh, quite successful um, translation. The name of the book uh, can go either way, depending on the publisher uh, and the different editions, but The Epitaph of a Small Winner, The Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Kubas, B-R-A-S-C-U-B-A-S. This book was recommended by one of our guests, and we shall salute her next week when we do the book. Um, and it came in the comments section, which I'll talk about later. But let me tell you a little bit about this book. It's a, a new translation, as I mentioned, 2020. And it's listed as a playful, incomparable masterpiece of one of the greatest Black authors in the Americas. Not America, Americas. 
Uh, and a few quotes about it before I tell you a tad bit about it from the New York Times, one of the Bibles, so to speak. Is it possible that the most modern, most startlingly avant-garde novel to appear this year was originally published in 1881. The Economist spouts, sprinkled with epigrams, dreams, gags, and asides, the story teases, dances, and delights. And finally, the New Yorker magazine, uh, one of the wittiest, most playful, and most alive and ageless books ever written. Let me tell you a little about it. The mixed race grandson of ex slaves, Macado de Assis, is not only Brazil's most celebrated writer, but also a writer of world stature, who has been championed by the likes of Philip Roth, Susan Sontag, Allen Ginsberg, John Updike, and Salman Rushdie. In his masterpiece, the 1880 novel, the posthumous memoirs of Ras Kubas, translated also as Epitaph of a Small Winner, the ghost of a decadent and disagreeable aristocrat decides to write his memoir. Wildly imaginable, wildly imaginative, wickedly witty, and ahead of his time, the novel has been compared to the work of everyone from Cervantes to Stern, to Joyce, to Novikov, to Calvino, and has influenced generations of writers around the world. Circle your calendar, join me here. <laughs> it is a marvelous book. I'm relishing it bits at a time, uh, rather than in one or two or three or four sittings. It's just so amusing and so wise and so fresh and uh, so so clever the whole concept is so clever from 1880 <laughs> i suggest you join me or watch it at another time thank you so much uh, for being with me today i hope you uh, learned something perhaps from following ezra as i did and certainly have a little bit of a deeper knowledge now about autism if you did like it uh, please do me a favor and press that little icon, thumbs up icon that you liked it. Or you may wanna share it uh, with a friend or a family member. Uh, please use that proper icon. And the other one is comment. If you'd like to comment on anything, the subject or the book or the reading experience you may have had, um, please do that. And also use that section if you'd like to suggest a book for us. There are four or five Fridays in every month of the year. Today is number two, number 124 in our program of readings. So we're always uh, on the up, up lookout for new books or famous old books, favorites. Also, there's an icon there, a large one on subscribe. We'd love you to do that as a vote of confidence, but also because it keeps us in number one spot in the state of Maine uh, for the one public library, small or large or medium, with the largest number of YouTube subscribers to our program's YouTube channel. Even some of the biggies, some of the southern cities, uh, we are number one and have been there for almost seven months now, which is terrific. So uh, please do press subscribe. It only requires your email address so we can keep you abreast of what's coming up. That's all. Thank you very much again uh, for this uh, hosting on this inspiring book. And um, I hope you have a good week ahead. Uh, spring seems to want to come up, uh, at least the flowers are ready. So let's hope we're there and also have a healthy week. And above all, think about what I said earlier. There's always a bit of spare time. Try to make an impact. Try to make an impact on somebody else's life. Who needs it? Thank you very much. Goodbye.